taken great care in this course to develop the history of keyboard instruments because they are so pivotal, the changes in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. We've observed their progression through the age of materials and mechanisms, through the age of electricity, and now we're observing more their development in the digital age. I have here in this room a harpsichord right there from my grandmother, and recently I purchased a digital piano. We'll talk more about that digital piano later. It is only in the digital age that the term keyboard can refer to either a part of a computer or a part of a musical instrument. We've already observed in the 19th and most of the 20th centuries that keyboards only reference the keys on pianos, organs, or other keyboard instruments. However, with computers becoming more commonplace in homes than pianos, now keyboards often mean a computer keyboard. The musical term keyboard came first and uh, now has been adopted to technological devices. Let's provide a little review here of the history of keyboard instruments in order to set the developments of the 20th century instruments in context. In a prior lecture, I mentioned that the organ was the earliest keyboard instrument. Its creation dates back centuries before the birth of Christ. This was an instrument heard in large sports gatherings by the Greeks and Romans, and later was an important instrument for the Christian church. In an important way, the organ was the world's first synthesizer. By varying which pipes were sounding at the same time, the musician could adjust the final sound. These changes in the overtones created different timbres. This video will help you to better understand this concept. The Hammond organ is one of the most popular keyboard instruments ever invented. One of the big draws is the player's ability to change the sound or timbre with drawbars. Each drawbar adds a pitch that blends with the main note. These extra pitches become overtones that make the timbre brighter. Let's stop here to relate this to the historic church organs. The Hammond organ in the video has draw bars that can engage or silence certain pitches or overtones. These pitches can sound like flutes, for instance. This is similar to the choices on the organ. In this picture, the white knobs are stops that can be pulled to engage pipes of a certain length. When a key is depressed, the correct pipe is sounded. The organist can play one pipe with a key or have several pipes play with a single key. These additions of pipes create sounds and in important ways, these synthesize a new sounding note on the organ. The Hammond organ takes it a step further by allowing the musician to mix the amount of sound at each frequency with the settings on the draw bars. Here, for instance, are some of the draw bars which are out all the way and some part way. Draw bars that extend fully to number eight have the frequency of sound the loudest. Those with lower numbers, such as two or three, produce less volume on the frequency chosen. The numbers before the bars refer to the length of pipe needed to produce the sound if it were a church organ. 
Here is 16 feet. Here is 8 feet, for example. The Hammond organ simulates that sound. Okay, let's watch the rest of the video. Looking through a spectrogram, we can see the overtones show up when the drawbars are pulled. So now I hope that you understand how organs were precursors to synthesizers, which are instruments that can create sounds from oscillators generating certain frequencies. Early versions of the synthesizers were not necessarily connected to piano-like keyboards. Remember this video from the last unit? In another field, music can now be produced entirely by electronics. No known instruments are involved. Coded information is punched out. An electronic music synthesizer does the rest. Notice that he is using a typewriter type of keyboard, not a piano keyboard. However, because of the great functionality of a piano keyboard, it is now most common for the musical keyboard to be one of the input tools for electronic music. The two videos on the Moog synthesizer will provide you with additional information. The BBC video gives some excellent background on the modular construction of the Moog synthesizer. One module, an oscillator, will generate a sound. Another module will provide the envelope for the sound. Let me further explain what is meant by the envelope. An envelope is the way in which a sound changes over time. Most often, the envelope is given with four terms. Attack, decay, sustain, and release. One of the reasons that a trumpet sounds different than a clarinet is that they have different envelopes. The way in which notes are started, the attack, is different. Other aspects of the envelope differ as well. A synthesizer can give the musician control over the envelope and thus imitate a live instrument or invent a new one. In another video, you will explore the different sounds between acoustic and electronic or digital pianos. This needs to be considered from multiple vantage points. The video supplied explores how the instruments sound after they are recorded, and then the sounds are transmitted digitally. That transmission will not be the same as hearing the instruments in per person. But there are many other things the performers consider as well. Remember the videos on the mechanisms of the grand piano that we viewed in the 19th century materials and mechanics module? The complex mechanisms of grand pianos are rarely reproduced in electronic or digital pianos. 
The feel of a well-made grand piano is not the same as another type of piano. Pianists cannot provide the same dynamic range, rapid repetition of notes and other nuances to the sound on instruments that do not have the grand piano mechanisms. Digital or upright pianos do not have the same mechanisms as grand pianos. For instance, if you slowly depress a key, you don't have the same little click that happens with the mechanism of a grand piano. There are several advantages to grand pianos. First, they look great. Also, they sound great. The dynamic range of the instrument is truly hard to match. However, acoustic pianos need special care. Changes in humidity require equipment that at one time of the year adds humidity and at another time of the year removes it. This video demonstrates the added equipment. Oh, let me interrupt right here just to point out the devices. So the rod on the floors that he's placed here, these are heating rods. And in the humidity of the summer, these will get rid of some of the humidity. This device that he has here would contain some water in it, and this humidifies the instrument in the winter months. In addition to the issues with humidity, acoustic pianos also need to be tuned regularly, most often twice a year. These are additional costs to owning the instrument. This summer, my wife and I made the decision to replace our grand piano with a digital piano. We wanted to avoid the costs and to downsize our instrument for when we would move. The disadvantage to an electronic instrument is that components are more prone to failure over time than acoustic pianos. If acoustic pianos are properly maintained, they can last for 50 years or longer. This digital piano has several features that are useful for my teaching. Let me show you a few of them. Here's a setting for a digital piano. And it actually allows me to change the type of piano to a Boisendorfer. But one of the features I like best on the digital piano is it gives me access to all of the general MIDI instruments. For instance, I use the organ sound quite a bit for uh, tuning with my students. I'll play a single drone, a single pitch, and the students will play their scales and arpeggios to that, and it's a great way for them to practice tuning. But yes, we have all the uh, general MIDI instruments here, the strings, the brass, And this all comes in quite handy for me if I want to record an accompaniment into MIDI, which I can then 
use as an accompaniment for my students and publish it on the web. One of the great advantages of recording into MIDI is that I can then change the tempos with my computer to various speeds so I create practice files for my students. And you've seen some of those practice files on my MIDI site. Well, this has got some wonderful features here. I've been enjoying this new instrument and it has uh, been very useful for me in my teaching. It does many things that a grand piano can't do.